back for another Sheriff of Sodium video. Today I'm going to give you the Applicant's Guide to Strategic Preference Signaling. And I'm going to give that to you because lately I've gotten several messages from applicants who are asking me how they should approach preference signaling in the upcoming residency selection cycle. It's a big deal. You know, go back a few years, we didn't have any preference signaling, but um, beginning with otolaryngology in the 2021 match, preference signaling has spread like wildfire. This is what it looks like for the upcoming application cycle. Almost every specialty is allowing program preference signals, but the number varies widely by specialty. On one end, you've got orthopedics and urology allowing 30 signals. On the other, you've got neurology and thoracic surgery allowing just three. And then there are specialties like dermatology or OBGYN or anesthesiology and radiology that give applicants both gold and silver signals. And on top of all this, applicants who are applying through ARES will get geographic preference signaling, where they get to designate a, re a preference for certain geographic regions or for urban versus suburban versus rural program settings. Preference signaling is probably the single biggest change for residency applicants since the introduction of ARES in 1994. I'm serious about that. This graphic that I'm showing you here, um, this was published in a major journal of orthopedic surgery and it shows an applicant holding the so-called strategic signaling spear. Now this wasn't just buried in some article. This, this was actually the leading article of the first issue of the year in 2023. And you know what was on the cover of that issue of the journal? It wasn't a bone or a, a cool fracture or some new piece of orthopedic hardware. On the cover of this journal was this very image, the image of an applicant throwing the strategic signaling spear goes to show you how important this issue has become. Now in the figure legend, the authors note that, quote, the shaft symbolizes the applicant's ability and responsibility to wield and aim the power of the signaling spear, end quote. And when you look at this picture, you might get the sense that um, at least the illustrator here envisions this applicant throwing the spear in the direction of programs, right? I mean, he's reaching back and he's chucking his strategic signaling spear toward programs and maybe he'll spear one. But that's, that's actually not how I see it. I see it like this. That spear is going toward other applicants because residency selection is a zero sum game. On match day, some people are gonna get the program they want, some aren't. Some are not gonna get anything at all. Now, you can argue that preference signaling may increase the quality of matching or that more applicants will get their number one instead of being lost in the pile. And I, and I think that there are data to support that. I'm not saying that preference signaling is a bad thing. But I am saying that in a world with more residency applicants than positions, it simply is not the case that everyone can win. Whenever applicants want the same thing, someone's gonna win and someone's gonna lose and every person that gets in displaces someone else. And what determines whether you're a winner or a loser? I mean, it could be a lot of things. It could be your USMLE score, your research experience, your school name, but something gets your application looked at and not someone else's. And now preference signals, they're one of those things. So make no mistake, applicants who spend their signals wisely, they're gonna gain advantage. And applicants who don't, and they stand here cluelessly, well, they're gonna end up on the sharp end of someone else's strategic signaling spear. Actually, I've seen this happen already. Back in March, I talked to several applicants from specialties that used a high signal number, and these applicants had gone unmatched despite having a beautiful CV. And really, the only mistake that they made in their whole application, their whole medical school career, was their choice about how to send their signals. So that's what I'm going to cover in this video. I'm going to give you my advice for how you, as an applicant, should strategically handle preference signaling. And I'm going to give you advice that's real world. Unlike most of the stuff that I talk about, um, the, my intent here is not to, to make residency selection as a system function better. And in one case, I'm probably going to give you advice that some people will consider unethical. But this is not about how to make preference signaling work better for programs or how to make uh, residency selection or the world a happier place. It's a video that's specifically about telling you as an applicant how to optimize your personal outcome through the choices that you make with signaling. And it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, everybody's circumstances are different. How strong of an applicant you are, how competitive the specialty you're applying in, the number of signals that that specialty allows, whether your couple's matching, whether your goal is to match at a, at a top program or just to match, how much distance there is between your favorite programs and your not so favorite programs, 
All of these things are going to impact the optimal deployment of preference signals in your situation. So as I work through this talk, I'm going to try to lay out a few overarching principles that will help you apply my advice to your particular situation. Just understand, your mileage may vary, and ultimately, you got to spend your signals in accordance with your own personal goals and values and not just listen to some rando on YouTube. And now, with no further ado, I'll give you part one, program preference signaling. And right here, I'm going to give you the first of my four principles. These are the things to think about when you're trying to apply preference signaling to your personal situation. And the first one of them is this. Put yourself in the program shoes. What I mean is, imagine how a program director is going to use and interpret the signals that they receive. I mean, step back and think, why did programs want this? How does preference signaling help them? The issue, obviously, is application fever. Now, you've heard me prattle on about this before. Every year, applicants apply to more and more residency programs. And these days, the average residency program receives around 100 applications for every spot they're trying to fill. That imposes a huge burden on program staff as they try to evaluate applicants in this huge pile and try to figure out who they're going to interview. But applicants aren't just applying to more programs. They're completing more interviews. Here's some data from the NRMP suggesting this. I'm showing you the number of contiguous ranks for successful applicants. And we can use this as a surrogate for the number of interviews that, that an applicant completes. Now, obviously, this is going to underestimate the actual number of interviews that applicants do because many applicants don't rank every single program that they interview at, and many applicants rank programs in multiple specialties. But understanding its limitations, we can use these figures to estimate the number of interviews that applicants are doing each year and how that's changed over time. And if you go back to 2007, well, in those tender times, applicants were doing maybe eight interviews in their specialty of choice. Um, and that increased rapidly over the next few years before sort of reaching the flat of the curve around 12 or so interviews by 2018, 2020. Um, and that probably reflects the limitations of time and space when you had to actually travel to the programs that you were going to interview at. You just ran out of time to do more than that. Um, then, of course, came virtual interviews. And you can see in 2022, the mean number of contiguous ranks submitted was 13.8. What that means is that nowadays, most well-qualified applicants, the, the kind of applicant that programs really want to match, they're doing 15 or more interviews. And that puts programs in a tough position as they're deciding who to interview because, you know, on the one hand, they want to find the best applicants. But the thing is, applicants who look good to one program usually look pretty good to others too. And if all you do is interview the, the, the top applicants who are each doing 15 interviews apiece, well, you're going to be using up a lot of your faculty's time interviewing applicants that may end up only having a 6 or 7% chance by probability alone of ending up at your program. And what that means is you've got to interview a ton of people or you might go unfilled. So every residency program wants two things. First and foremost, they want qualified applicants. But among the qualified applicants that, that apply there, they want applicants who actually want to go to that program. And that's in part maybe because they think that those folks will be happier and more effective residents. But it's also in part because it allows them to maximize their own efficiency in the interview process. Now, if you put yourself in the program's shoes, it's pretty easy to get a general sense of an applicant's qualifications just by looking at their ARIS application. But it's often a lot harder to figure out just how interested they are in your program. I mean, what if an applicant looks good, but um, you know, their whole life has been on the West Coast and your program's on the East Coast? Are you going to interview them, or are you going to focus your attention on a similar applicant who's actually rooted on the East Coast? What if you get an applicant who looks too good? I mean, do you take the time to interview them? Or do you assume that they're just going to end up at an Ivy League program at the end of the day and you save yourself some time and energy? It's hard for programs to know whether an applicant is serious or whether they're just checking boxes on ARIS. So this is where program preference signaling comes in. A program signal shows you that an applicant is serious and deserves your attention. And that leads me to my second principle, which is this. For an applicant, a signal's value depends on its ability to increase the probability of an interview offer. Now, if you've been listening to what I've been saying, and you put together principles one and two, then it should be obvious that the best way to strategically deploy your signals is by using them on programs where you're qualified, maybe even overqualified, but your seriousness might not be clear. 
or you could use them at programs where you're qualified, but an interview is not a slam dunk and an expression of interest might tip you over into the interview pile instead of the no interview pile. So with that foundation, I'm going to give you a little bit more detail so that you can decide how to maximize the value of signals in your particular situation. I'm going to walk you through the steps that I think you should take. Step one is to list in descending order the programs that you want. Notice that the word want is underlined. That part is critically important. This is not a list of programs that you're applying to or a list of programs that you'd consider. This is a list of programs that you'd really like to match at in order. So make your list while no one is looking because this list is just for you and I don't want you to be unduly influenced by what programs your advisors think are cool or what programs you think are going to impress your friends or family or sound nice when they're called out at graduation. You can take those things into consideration when you're making your list if that stuff's important to you, but, um, but don't be biased. This list is just for you. Now when you make your list, you need to pick programs that you have a non-zero chance of matching at. Strategy can only help you achieve things that are achievable, so be realistic. At the same time, though, focus here on what you want, not where you think you're going to get in. We're going to get to that in a moment. I cannot emphasize how important this step is. It is the foundation of everything else that I'm going to tell you, and it actually leads me to our third principle. That principle is this. You can only win if you get something that you want. If you engineer some masterful signaling strategy that helps you get interviewed at a program that you don't really want to go to, well, brother, you didn't game the system. You gamed yourself. So we've got to start with the list of programs that you honest to God want in descending order. And once you have that list, I mean, you could just stop there and just go down the list as far as however many signals you have. And um, I guess that'd be true preference signaling. That's what the economists who first designed this kind of system, I guess that's what they expect that you'll do. But it's not necessarily the best strategy. So after you've made your list, now we're going to analyze it. In step two, we're going to assess the probability of getting interviewed without sending a signal. Now, the reason that we're doing this should be obvious if you're paying attention to principle number two. If you send a signal to a program that was already going to interview you, well, you haven't improved your situation because they were already going to interview you. Similarly, if you choose to send a signal to a program that's some pie-in-the-sky dream and they're not going to interview you, well, they still ain't going to interview you. And again, you're no better off than if you hadn't signaled them. Actually, you're worse off because now you wasted your signals and now you're standing around all glassy-eyed and slack-jawed while someone else's strategic signaling spear is airborne en route to your ear hole. The strategic way to spend a signal is to use it to get an interview that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So that's what we're going to do in step two. We're going to find those programs by carefully examining your list of programs that you want and estimating how likely it is that each one of those would give you an interview. You may be able to do this just, just on vibes. I mean, most applicants have a pretty good sense of programs where they're going to be competitive and programs that'll be a reach. And so you may be able to come up with a scale like this just by instinct. And if you can, well, the sweet spot for signaling, it's right in here. It's right in here in these middle categories. I mean, if you look at the program's name and you say, you know, I think I'm competitive, but I mean, it's the match. You never know. That may be a program that you drop a signal on. If you look at the program's name and your instinct is, man, I'd be shocked if I didn't get an interview there, even without send a, sending a signal. Um, you don't want to send a signal there to make an already high probability even higher, unless, of course, that program is a program that you so desperately want to go to that, uh, that even a small decrease in the probability is just intolerable. You, know, you can't tolerate even a small chance of things going wrong. Now, I sometimes hear from applicants who say that they cannot estimate these probabilities. They say, but, but I have no idea where I'm competitive, none whatsoever. That's why I'm applying to 200 programs. But here I got I to gotta push back a little bit. I think that most applicants do know, and, and actually I think there's some data to support that. If you, if you survey applicants before they submit their applications and ask what they think is going to happen, they're actually pretty accurate about it. Um, so I think most applicants do know, or, or at least they can know. And I know, I know it's trendy to have an Instagram post after match day and say, OMG, never in a million years did I think I would match at this program. Hashtag blessed. And I get that modesty is polite, but I tell you, I'm calling BS. But if you're out there listening to this video and you're honestly struggling with this, well, let me give you some advice uh, on where to start. 
First, take the 30,000 foot view and try to figure out in the universe of applicants for your specialty, where do you fall? Go back to principle one and put yourself in the program shoes. Out of the bell curve of applicants that they're likely to review, where do you think your application is going to be? Um, I mean, do you think you're better than most applicants, weaker than most, about average? What do you think? And if you don't know or you don't know where to begin, look at the NRMP's charting outcomes in the match report for your specialty and your educational background. Are your USMLE scores higher or lower than the average? Do you have more or fewer research items? And after you decide what you think, only after you decide so that you're not biased, ask your advisors, what do they think? What percentile of applicant do they think that you fall in? Next, take the 30,000 foot view of the universe of programs in that specialty. Where do you think this particular program falls? Is it one of the most famous programs in the field? Or maybe they've had years where they've gone unmatched. Take a look at the program's data on AMC Residency Explorer. How similar are you to the residents who are actually in the program? Or go to the program's webpage and look at the residents. Do they come from schools like yours? That's especially important if you're a DO or an international medical graduate. Or you can go to your medical school's advising office and ask them for the list of programs from which students from your school have matched or receive interview offers over the past four or five cycles. Ask them, what do you think? Where does, where does my profile as an applicant fit? How does it compare to the typical applicant from my school? Are you about average, better than average, below average? Um, you can also get online. Use the applicant spreadsheets that are on Reddit or the data that's on Doximity's Residency Navigator or any other number of resources. You obviously will never know the probabilities for sure, but that's okay. You don't have to be precise to be strategic. Please do not skip this step either, even though assessing these probabilities can be difficult. Preference signaling rewards applicants who estimate probabilities well, and it punishes those who don't. Now there's one other thing that you've got to consider when you're trying to evaluate the probability that you'll get an interview offer without sending a signal. And that's the behavior of other applicants. And this is such an important point that it's actually the fourth principle. I want you to consider what other applicants are doing. Let me explain what I mean using real data. Let's take a look at four specialties who used signaling last year. Pediatrics, internal medicine, OBGYN, and orthopedic surgery. Let's start with pediatrics. As you can see here, pediatrics gave its applicants five signals. There's 248 pediatric programs. Now, where do you suppose applicants chose to send their signals? Do you think that those signals are equally distributed among programs? Of course not. This is what the actual distribution of signals looked like for pediatric residency programs last year. The light blue bars on this chart show the total number of applications that the program received. The royal blue bars show the number of applicants who signaled that program. The AMC anonymizes these data, but I mean, if you're in pediatrics, it's not hard to guess which programs these are. Uh, Boston Children's, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Seattle Children's, so on. But notice how many signals they're receiving. Some of these big name programs, they're getting 400, almost 500 signals apiece. How many applicants do you think that they're going to interview? Well, we know from NRMP data that the average pediatric residency program, the average, has to rank nine applicants for every position they're trying to fill. And the most popular programs probably can rank significantly fewer than that. What that means is that these programs are receiving so many signals that they can use the absence of a signal to quickly screen out applicants and, and just focus their attention on the applicants for whom they know that their program is already in the applicant's top five. We see the same thing in internal medicine. Now here there's more medicine programs and so the scale is a little bit compressed. Notice that the top programs in internal medicine are receiving over a thousand signals apiece. That is more than enough for those programs just to focus their recruiting on applicants who signaled them, especially because the average internal medicine program only ranks 6.9 applicants for every ranked position. What that means is, if you're an applicant and you actually really want to go to one of these quote unquote top programs, well, your probability of getting an interview without signaling is, is getting pretty slim, assuming that you don't have some major in with the program that, that's outside of the signaling system. 
And what I'm describing to you here, this is a general principle. This is not just isolated to pediatrics and internal medicine. Across all specialties that use signaling, the top 10% of programs receive around 25% of all the signals. So if you're seriously aiming for a top 10% program, you need to strongly consider sending a signal because your probability of getting interviewed without a signal is probably not as good as you think it is. So let's go back and take a look at OBGYN orthopedics. Last year, these were the only two specialties that gave applicants a large number of signals. OBGYN gave applicants 18 between their gold and silver signals. Orthopedics gave 30. Now this year, there's many more specialties that are going to be using big signaling, urology, anesthesiology, diagnostic and interventional radiology. Um, so these, the lessons that we're about to learn here are going to apply if you're applying in those specialties. Um, notice also that OBGYN and orthopedics are both more competitive specialties than internal medicine or pediatrics. So the average program fills with just 4.4 applicants for each of the positions that they're trying to fill. This is the distribution of signals for OBGYN. Just like we saw before, the, the big name programs are getting the most signals. But compared to what we saw with specialties using a low signaling number, this is overall a flatter distribution. And, and here I'm showing you just the silver signals. You could add on another three gold signals on top of this if we wanted. The point here really is the absolute number of signals that each program receives. Even many of the less popular programs are still receiving 100 signals. That's more than they need to fill their interview slate. From the NRMP's program director survey, we know the average OBGYN program only ranks 73 applicants. So the same lesson about applying to a big name program in pediatrics or internal medicine applies to most programs in OBGYN. If you don't send at least a silver signal to an OBGYN program, you're not likely to get an interview. Overall, only around 5% of non-signaled applications in OBGYN resulted in interview offers. Now let's look at orthopedics that use 30 signals. The average orthopedics program ranks 51 applicants, but take a look. The top programs are getting over 500 signals. Some of the less popular programs are still getting over 200 signals. If you do not send a signal to an orthopedic surgery program, you're not going to get an interview. Now, the official figure is that around 1% of non-signaled applications resulted in an interview, but when you drill down on that, it seems like many of those non-signaled interview offers were actually from applicants um, at their home institution or at a place where they did an away rotation, and they were just told not to send a signal to them. These aren't just people who were getting randomly pulled out of the pile. The point is this. As the number of signals that a specialty allows increases, the probability of getting an interview offer without signaling decreases. And I don't think this is a linear function because depending on the competitiveness of the field, somewhere around 10 or 15 signals um, is enough to saturate programs with signaled applications. And they no longer need to look at applicants who don't signal them. There's a natural separation in programs that use a high versus a low signal number in the 2023-2024 application cycle. The dividing line is just above seven. So on one side, we've got orthopedics, urology, dermatology, neurosurgery, otolaryngology, OBGYN, anesthesiology, and diagnostic and interventional radiology, which share a signaling system. On the other side, you've got EM, IM, FM, surgery, pathology, PEDS, PM&R, psychiatry, plastics, the neurologies, and thoracic surgery. So if you're applying to a specialty that's on this side of the chart, then you need to realize that the number of signals that you're allotted is going to function as an application cap you're going to get very few interview offers from programs that you do not signal. Now listen, you're still free to apply to as many programs as you want, and it may make sense to apply to a program without a signal, especially in certain situations, like for instance, if you think that that program may be undersubscribed, you, you have reason to believe that it's one of the less popular programs in the whole specialty. Or it may make sense if you're a top-notch applicant and you think, well, maybe they'll go into the pile and I'm one of the best people in the pile. Um, or perhaps most likely of all, if you have some in with the program that will get them to, to give your application a look even without sending a signal. Maybe you know somebody there, you've done research with somebody there, you did an away there, whatever it is. But listen, if you do not fall in those categories, my advice is to save your money. Uh, you need to think long and hard about where to send your precious signals. That's where you need to put in the work. But then I think you should keep that $29 per application that you would have spent and um, go get yourself a month of HBO Max or uh, take your significant other out to Chipotle and get him a burrito. 
Now, if you're applying to programs on this side of the chart, then you're still going to get interview offers from non-signal programs. But you need to understand that the more popular a program is, the less that's going to be true. And if you're serious about going to a quote unquote top program, you better be prepared to send them a signal. All right. So by now we've assessed the probability of getting interviewed without sending a signal. And so at this point, we should have a provisional idea of which programs we're going to signal. And that means we're ready for step three. Here, we're going to double check your work and we're going to break any ties by looking at those signal assignments through the lens of strategy. You may not need to change your assignments, but there's maybe a few things that you ought to consider. The first is, and this is especially true if you're on the fence about where to send your signals, is you should try to zig where others zag. A signal means more to a program that doesn't get a lot of signals than it means to a program that gets a ton of signals. And applicants tend to like the same programs. If your program's name rings out in the U.S. News and World Report rankings, or if it's located in a trendy city like um, L.A. or New York or Denver or Seattle, we well, are probably going to have a lot of applicants who are signaling you to look at them. If your program doesn't have quite that name recognition, or if it's located in the Rust Belt or a bad weather climate, you're probably going to get fewer signals. But your clinical training may be the same, and sometimes the cost of living and quality of life may actually be favorable when you go off the beaten path. Again, strategy is only good if you get something you want. Remember principle number three. But all other things being equal, you're going to get a signal boost by sending your signals to a program that other applicants aren't showering with signals. Number two, when you look at your provisional list, make sure that you are aligning your signals with your risk tolerance. Because this is America. You get to choose your own adventure. So if you want to throw all your signals at the most prestigious big name programs in the specialty, go for it. YOLO, right? Go big or go home. And if you're okay with the possibility that you may not match at those places, and if you don't, some of the programs that would have loved to have you come, they may not give you a look because they didn't think you were serious. Well, go for it. Most people are probably more risk averse, and they might justifiably choose to completely ignore the quote unquote best programs in the field and focus their signals on programs where they think there's a greater chance that their interest is going to be reciprocated. So think about your goals and your personal risk tolerance and choose the path that feels right to you. But do me this one favor. Even if you take a high risk, high reward path, please do this. Please send at least one of your signals to a safety program. What I mean is a program where you'd honestly be happy to go to, but you think your application is going to be pretty competitive. And I say this piece of advice because for almost every single applicant, the cost of going unmatched is much, much steeper than being undermatched. So my strong advice is to make sure that you show some signaling love to at least one program that's likely to love you back, and probably more than that, depending on your, your personal situation. And that brings us to step four. And at this point, we've got our list, we've looked at it, we've double checked it, and so now you're going to drop your signals. And when interview offers roll in, you're going to play the hand that you're dealt to the best of your ability. Before I move on and discuss geographic preference signaling, um, I have two other things that I want to cover. One is a frequently asked question that's so frequently asked that I want to preemptively address it here. And it's some version of this. Um, applicants ask, well, why are you telling me to focus on the probability of getting an interview offer? Shouldn't I be afraid that programs are going to hold the fact that I didn't signal them against me when, the, when they're making their ranking? And shouldn't I um, take that into consideration? And I think that if you're looking at this through the lens of strategy, the appropriate strategy is to focus on the probability that a signal will get you an interview offer. And I think that there's a few pieces of argument and data that would lead you to that conclusion. First, we've got some data from the AMC. When they asked program directors uh, how they use signals, 90% of programs, they're about, depending on the specialty, um, actually use the preference signals to find candidates to interview. At the same time, the AMC does have some data that maybe about 60% of programs, um, depending on the specialty, are using signaling data when they're making their rank order list decisions. So this kind of concern, it's not that it's unfounded, but the first data point to consider is you're looking at 90% using it one way, 60% using it the other. A second point to consider is a logical one, which is this. If you don't get an interview at a program, uh, you're out. Anything that happens when the program is meeting to figure out their rank order list, well, it doesn't concern you. 
if you don't get your foot in the door on the front end, then everything downstream of that is irrelevant. And so from a strategic standpoint, the way that you maximize the value of your signals is by getting your feet into as many doors as you possibly can. A third and final point to consider is this. Even though 60% of programs may say that they use signaling data when they're making their rank order list, I don't know how impactful it's going to really be. Um, the worst case scenario that a program would unrank you because you didn't send a preference signal, that simply will not occur. It's illogical. If a program wasn't going to rank you because you didn't send a signal, they wouldn't have interviewed you in the first place. They wouldn't have wasted their time. If you get an interview, you are in the running to match unless you blow it. Um, if you look at data from the NRMP's program director survey, overall 90% of the applicants who get interviewed get ranked. If you get an interview, that becomes the most important determinant of your final ranking for almost every program. The preference signals that you sent or didn't send back in September, I've got to think that's a distant memory for almost every program. Moreover, if you didn't send a program signal um, and you find out that you truly fall in love with that program, there are ways to overcome that. You can tell the program after the fact, you know, I fell in love with you guys and, and you're, I'm going to rank you number one if that's honestly true. So for all these reasons, from the standpoint of strategy, the optimal strategy, the strategy will lead to the greatest likelihood of matching, is to maximize the number of interview offers that you receive, and that's why I recommend that approach here. The second thing that I wanted to mention before we move on to geographic preference signaling is a final piece of advice. And this is the piece of advice that I promised before that some of you will probably find unsavory or even unethical. But it's pragmatic, and it may help some of you avoid going unmatched, and I'm going to share it here anyway. So here it is. If it hasn't occurred to you already, you should consider applying to a backup specialty or even multiple backup specialties. Obviously, dual applying is nothing new. Applicants have done that for years. But the addition of preference signaling and the way that the AMC has chosen to implement it in ARIS have made it much more valuable and strategic for applicants to apply to multiple specialties. Remember, the value of preference signaling is that it allows an applicant to stand out in a sea of otherwise indistinguishable applicants. It's like holding up a little sign that says, hey, look at my application. You know, don't ignore me. I, I really want to be here. But the problem is that ARIS has chosen not to limit the number of specialties that you can preference signal. So if you're an applicant and um, let's say your heart's desire is to become a neurosurgeon, well, you get to signal 25 neurosurgery programs. But you could also if you wanted, apply in general surgery. And when you do, you'll get five preference signals. Now, it might be that you would rather match at any one of the 115 neurosurgery programs that exist instead of at one of the five general surgery programs that you signal. But when the general surgery program director reviews the applications, they aren't going to know that they're the 116th program on your list because your application is going to appear indistinguishable from an applicant whose singular dream was to be a general surgeon and who desperately wants to match at that program and so they sent one of their precious five program signals. Dual applying is not for everybody. Let me remind you again of principle number three. Strategy is only good if it helps you get something that you want. And if you only want to be a neurosurgeon, then you don't win if you match in general surgery. You'd be better off going unmatched and then just reapplying. But there are some cases in which dual applying is really a no-brainer. Let's say you're applying to plastic surgery. That's a highly competitive field. Maybe 70 or 75 percent of applicants will match, and that's in a good year. But you can become a plastic surgeon by starting in a general surgery residency. So if your only goal is eventually to become a plastic surgery, then the best strategy is to avail yourself of the five general surgery program signals and use those to open some additional doors for you. And some applicants who have the goal of becoming a plastic surgeon, well, they might even choose to tap into the preference signaling systems of dermatology or otolaryngology, given that they might be able to get close to their ultimate career goals by going that route. And attaching a signal to their application could get their application some attention. Another example uh, is international medical graduates. Now, many IMGs have their heart set on doing a certain specialty. And if that's you, then fine. Just apply to the specialty that you really want. But there are many IMGs who would be happy doing multiple specialties. And what they want most of all is the opportunity to live and train in the United States. And if that's you, then I would recommend applying to IMG-friendly programs in every specialty that has preference signaling. 
I would almost guarantee that you will have a higher chance of matching by applying to seven internal medicine programs, seven emergency medicine programs, five family medicine mental, uh, programs, five pathology, pediatric, psychiatry programs, and three neurology programs. I bet you have a better odds of matching if you took that strategy than if you just applied to 200 internal medicine programs. Because the presence of those signals, if they're distributed thoughtfully to a program where your application is actually competitive, it will ensure that your application gets looked at instead of automatically screened out by some ARIS filter. Now, it should be obvious also that applying to multiple specialties requires some additional strategy. I would not recommend double dipping at the same institution. That is, I would not apply to multiple specialties with a preference signal at the same place. And if you apply to multiple specialties, then you probably need to have your letter writers write multiple letters, and you're going to probably have to have multiple personal statements, and you're going to have to keep all of that stuff very well organized and very well labeled so that you don't mistakenly send documents talking about how you dream of becoming an anesthesiologist to a program director in general surgery. For many applicants, applying to multiple specialties is one of the single most strategic decisions that you can make. And I think this is only going to apply to the 2023-2024 application season. In the future, I think ARIS is going to close this loophole and allow an applicant only to preference signal one specialty in ARIS. And here, I think it's fair to point out that it's not the AMC doesn't know this is going to be a problem. I personally, and I'm sure many others as well, have pointed it out to them. They've just declined to do anything about it. In fact, the AMC recently chose to share these data, which I've adapted here into this graphic, that shows the proportion of applicants in each specialty who actually availed themselves of at least two preference signaling systems last year. As you can see, the numbers are not insignificant, and this is only going to grow over time. And ultimately, many programs are going to get burned by this because they're going to waste their time interviewing applicants that look on paper like it's one of their favorite programs, but in reality, it's not even the applicant's favorite specialty. And it's not just programs that are going to get it burned either. Some applicants are going to get burned because, as I pointed out at the beginning, the match is a zero-sum game. So some applicant who gets interviewed or, or matches into their backup specialty is going to displace an applicant who only ever dreamed of matching in that specialty. And all these people are going to advocate for this loophole to be closed in future cycles. And if ARIS doesn't close this loophole, the value of this strategy is still going to be diminished in future years because programs are going to get wise to the fact that preference signaling is being gamed, and they're going to stop looking at signals the way that they do now. But until either of those things happens, looking at your situation and your career goals and deciding whether applying to multiple specialties and taking advantage of the preference signaling systems in those specialties might be right for you is a part of any good strategic preference signaling strategy. Now it's time to move on to part two and discuss geographic preference signaling. Last year, ARIS did a pilot of asking applicants their geographic regional preferences for certain specialties, and apparently it was so successful that now it's been incorporated into the main ARIS application. In fact, everything that I'm discussing is not even technically called preference signaling, even though that's what it is. And this year, ARIS is going to ask you for two types of geographic preferences, one for regions and another for a preference between urban, suburban, and rural settings. First, let's talk about the regions. Here are the ARIS geographic regions for the upcoming 2023-2024 application cycle. The United States and the many fine residency programs that it contains have been cleaved up into nine distinct geographic regions indicated here. And these regions are nice and compact and look good on the map, although they don't necessarily conform to the social or political or even geographic boundaries between regions. So you have situations like an applicant who might be interested in, I don't know, say, programs in Chicago and St. Louis, but they have to signal two different regions to get to that. Or an applicant who's interested in being somewhere between Washington and Boston, again, you have to signal three different regions to cover that area. Fortunately, ARIS allows applicants to signal up to three different geographic regions. ARIS also allows applicants the option of reporting that they have no geographic preference. So if you honestly don't care whether you end up in Oklahoma or Oregon, you can say that you have no preference. Or if you're concerned that you may face adverse selection if you don't choose that program's region, you can choose that option in that case too. And depending on the specialty, a significant number of applicants last year chose to do this, ranging from a high of 63% in neurosurgery down to 17% in diagnostic radiology. 
Before we get into the strategy of geographic signaling, I think it's important that applicants understand what programs see when they signal these different geographic preferences. So as an example, let's imagine that there are five applicants who apply to the residency program where I work, which is in Virginia. And according to ARIS, that's in the South Atlantic geographic region. Well, if an applicant truly in their heart wants to be in Virginia and they signal the South Atlantic region, well, that's what I see in their ARIS application is I see South Atlantic. If an applicant truly wants to be in Florida, which is also in the South Atlantic region, I also see South Atlantic. If an applicant has no geographic preference and they say that, then what I see on their ARIS application is no division preference. If I've got an applicant, though, that wants to be in California and they signal other regions, what I see in ARIS is nothing. The field is blank, and it looks exactly the same as if there was an applicant who chose not to participate in this kind of preference signaling at all. At all. The key thing that you need to understand is that this is all that programs will see. They will either see the name of their region or they will see no division preference. They will not see the names of the regions that you did select. Um, they will only see the absence of any region or no division preference. And so from that, certain programs might infer, if it's left blank, they, they know that logically it means you wanted to be in a different region or you just didn't participate in preference signaling altogether. And here I should say, as a matter of strategy, don't opt out of geographic preference signaling. You have nothing to gain. Really, the only question is whether you signal regions and which regions you signal, or whether you signal no geographic preference. Last year, I talked to a lot of applicants that wasted a lot of time thinking about the question of whether they should say no geographic preference or signal certain regions. It's a hard question to answer because everyone's true preferences and circumstances are different, but what it comes down to is this. If you choose to signal a region, are you going to open more doors by doing that, or are you going to close more doors by programs being turned off that you didn't signal their region? Last year we just had to speculate, but now we have some data, and I think for most applicants, signaling regions is going to be the preferable strategy. Let me show you why. Here's some real data. Let's use anesthesiology for an example. Let's consider the overall median interview probability by whether an applicant signaled that region or whether they signaled a different region or whether they said they had no geographic region preference. And this is what the figures looked like last year. So at a program where you signaled a different geographic region, that's the blue bar here, and overall, taking into consideration all programs, all applicants who did this, 4% of those applications yielded an interview offer. If you said that you had no geographic preference, then considering all programs, and again, there's high variability, but overall, the median interview probability was 6%, so a little bit better. However, if you signal the geographic preference for programs in that region, then your median interview probability for geographic signaling was 12%. So let's take those real probabilities and let's apply them to a situation where we have an applicant. And let's say, for the sake of this example, this is an applicant who's a typical USMD senior applicant, and they're going to apply to around 60 anesthesiology programs. That would be the figure that would be average from last year's application data. And let's say that this person honestly doesn't have geographic preferences. They'd be happy going anywhere. And in matter of fact, they're going to distribute their 60 applications at random all over the country. Okay. Now, under scenario number one, let's imagine that this person chooses a strategy of saying, you know, I don't really have any geographic preferences. I don't want to close any doors. So I'm going to say no geographic preference. And so of those 60 applications that they submit, they're going to have a 6% chance of getting an interview offer at each of them, and they're going to end up with around four interviews. Now, for this example, I'm ignoring program preference signaling. We'll incorporate that here later on in the talk, but for now, let's just focus on the geographic signaling. If I ended up with just four interviews, if you take the NRMP's charting outcomes data for MD seniors, on average, an applicant who interviews at four anesthesiology programs has a 60% chance of matching. The applicant actually does a little bit better under scenario two, where they say, you know, I notice that all these regions actually have different numbers of programs. And since I don't really care where I go, I'm going to signal the three regions that have the greatest number of anesthesiology programs. Um, but I'm still going to apply all over the country. So I'm just going to distribute my applications at random, and some of them will be in those regions and some won't. Well, if you do that strategy, you're going to end up getting a 12% chance of interviewing at programs in the regions that you signaled, and a 4% chance of getting an interview at, at regions that you didn't signal. And if you do the math, average out, you're going to end up with five interviews. So you actually did a little bit better. 
And again, if we use NRMP charting outcomes in the match data, a typical anesthesiology MD applicant who gets five interviews has a 70% chance of, of matching. So they've done better, not just in the number of interviews, but in real match probability if we take these probabilities to be valid. So now let's do a third scenario where the applicant's even a little bit smarter and they say, you know, I really don't care where I go. I'm going to signal the regions that have the greatest number of programs, and I'm only going to put in my applications to those programs. All 60 of my applications are going to go into these three regions that I signal. Well, now if you do the math on that, you're going to end up with seven interviews and a 78% chance of matching on average. So as you can see from the probabilities that I showed on the previous slide and by working through this example, there are programs that will be turned off if you don't signal their geographic region, and you're going to have some doors closed because of that. But for the average person, that's going to be offset by more doors opening by choosing to use geographic preference signaling, and the probabilities will be even better if you choose to use those geographic regions thoughtfully. One element of thoughtful geographic preference signaling is deciding where programs are likely to be because programs are not equally distributed across these regions. Here's some data from OBGYN. You can see the bars on the bottom correspond to the number of programs in each region. Notice that some regions have very few programs, only nine in the Mountain West, 13 in the West North Central, 14 in the East South Central. Most programs in OBGYN are concentrated on the East Coast and Great Lakes region, and they're going to fall into the East, North, Central, South Atlantic, and Middle Atlantic regions. The data I'm showing you here are just for OBGYN, but this general pattern is true for every specialty. For, so for those of you who really don't have a geographic preference, one thing that you may want to consider is where programs are. But the other thing you may want to consider is our fourth principle and think about what other applicants are doing and what regions they are likely to signal. So for sake of example here, I've got a different specialty. I've got general surgery. Um, so again, on the bottom, I've got hatched bars that show um, the percentage of programs that are located in each of these regions. And again, you can see most programs are located in the East Coast and Great Lakes region. So East, North, Central, South Atlantic, and Middle Atlantic. But those regions aren't necessarily where applicants express that they want to be. So if you look, you can see um, most regions have approximately the same proportion of applicants indicating that preference as there are um, programs in that region. So you look at the Pacific West, the Mountain West, the South Atlantic, the percentage of applicants who say they want to be in that region is similar to the overall percentage of programs that are located in that region. But there's one exception, and that's New England. New England is consistently oversubscribed, and that's probably related to some of the high prestige programs that are located there. Um, in contrast, the East North Central region is the most consistently undersubscribed region. Here are data from orthopedic surgery showing you the same thing. There are more orthopedic surgery residency programs located in this East North Central region than in any other region. 22% of programs are located in this region, and yet only 12% of applicants signal that region. So as you're deciding what regions to signal, Remember the principles that we developed before. You can't win by going to a place that you really don't want to be. At the same time, when you're picking regions, recognize that programs aren't distributed equally and neither are applications to those programs. And you may get more bang for your buck by sending signals to places that don't get so many of them. Now, one last piece of strategic advice about geographic region signaling before I move on. I mentioned before that ARIS allows you to signal up to three geographic regions doesn't mean you have to signal three. You could choose to signal one or two. But if you do, you're a fool because there's absolutely no benefit in signaling fewer than three regions if you choose to, to indicate a geographic preference. The only time that would make sense is if you truly, literally, were only applying to programs that are contained within one or two regions. So at this point, we've talked about program signaling and we've talked about geographic region signaling. And now it's time to answer another frequently asked question by putting those two things together. That frequently asked question is something like this. Should I use my program signals in the same region as my geographic preference or should I use them elsewhere? I mean, should we double up and try to really show programs that we're interested or should we try to create more shots on goal by signaling programs that are outside of those geographic regions? Again, this was a topic that uh, was debated last year in the absence of any evidence, but now we've got some data to make an informed decision on this point. When we worked through that anesthesiology example a few slides ago, I showed you just the probabilities of getting an interview uh, with or without a geographic region signal. That was the 4, 6, and 12% probabilities that you see on this slide. 
But this slide also shows you the probabilities of getting an interview if you also signaled, sent a program signal to that region. And you can see how much the probabilities improve. So for a region where you did not send a geographic signal, but you did send a program signal, instead of a 4% chance of getting an interview, you got a 28% chance of getting an interview. If you said you have no geographic preference, but you sent a program signal, you got a 40% chance of getting an interview. And if you signaled a region and sent them a signal, a 61% chance on average of getting an interview. So let's work through that example again and, and evaluate how some different strategies might play out. So again, we'll assume a typical USMD applicant who's applying to 60 anesthesiology programs last year and has five program signals to send. Now this year, of course, anesthesiology applicants will have 15 program signals to send. So the probabilities that we're using are going to be different this year, but it's the principle that I'm trying to get at. So for scenario one, our applicant declares that they've got no geographic preference, but they do send out five program signals. So using the probabilities that we saw in the previous slide, where you have a 40% chance of an interview with a signaled application and a 6% chance with a non-signaled application, this applicant's going to end up with five interviews. And using the charting outcomes in the match data, we'd have about a 70% chance of success in the match. In scenario number two, the applicant signals the three largest regions and then sends their five program signals outside of those regions. So that means that um, they've got a 12% chance of getting an interview within those signaled regions and then only a 28% chance of getting an interview off of their um, signaled applications because they're disparate with the geographic signal that was sent. Well, this applicant still is going to end up with eight interviews, and now they've got an 83% chance of matching. So they did better than the person who signaled no geographic preference. And now let's look at a third scenario where the applicant signals the three largest regions, but now puts all their five program signals within a region that they've also geographically signaled. Now, if you use the probabilities that we saw before of 12% and 61%, this applicant's going to end up with 10 interviews, and on average, such an applicant would have an 88% chance of matching. So in this example, using data from last year's anesthesiology match, the optimal strategy is to send your program signals to the same regions that you've geographically signaled. My opinion is that this is likely the optimal signaling strategy across the specialties. Here's a different specialty, dermatology from last year. Notice again that the highest probability of getting an interview occurred at programs that received both a program signal and where you signaled their geographic region. There is a penalty for having a different geographic preference than the program that you're applying to compared to saying that you have no geographic preference and that you'd be willing to go everywhere. But there's a benefit from having your geographic preferences aligned. And for most real world applicants who realistically do have some geographic preferences, this is probably going to be the optimal strategy because you can line up the programs that you really want to go to in one of those three ARIS regions that you can select. Here are the probabilities for pediatrics. Again, we see that the highest probabilities of getting an interview go to those who signal the program and that geographic region. But here there's actually something interesting. Applicants who said that they have no geographic preference actually had a lower probability of getting interviewed than those who had a different geographic preference. Now, why would that be the case? I'm going to dwell on this for just a moment because I think that it makes an important point. All these data that I'm showing you, they, they're very useful data, but I think we have to be careful about overextending them because they're all observational data. I mean, nobody was getting randomized to pick different geographic regions or say no preference. Applicants who choose to say they have no preference, they differ systematically from those who express a geographic preference. And in the universe of pediatric applicants, this category of applicants is enriched with international medical graduates. Compared to USMDs and DOs, international medical graduates are more likely to say that they have no geographic preference, maybe because they honestly don't, or maybe because they, they fear closing doors at programs by selecting the wrong geographic region. But many of these applicants have lower probabilities of getting interview offers than other applicant types, independent of whatever they signaled with their geographic preference. So we have to be careful when we interpret these data. Here's one more specialty, orthopedics. And here we actually see the opposite. Applicants who said that they had no geographic preference, they actually had the best odds of getting interviewed. Now it could be that orthopedic surgery program directors are just 
uniquely resistant to the siren song of geographic preference signaling. And if they see an applicant that says they've got no geographic preference, that's just the same to them as seeing the, the very name of the region in which they live and train people to be orthopedic surgeons. And maybe that's why these probabilities are exactly the same, is that orthopedic surgery program directors just really don't care about it. But I think that the likeliest explanation for this is the same thing that we saw in pediatrics. There's systematic differences between the type of applicant that says no geographic preference and the one that says that they have geographic preference. Just like we saw in the previous example, in some ways it's an expression of confidence in the strength of your application to signal a geographic region rather than trying to keep all doors open by saying you don't have a preference. The types of programs that applicants who are in this category are applying to, I bet they differ systematically from the types of programs that applicants here are applying to. It's tempting to speculate that this category is actually enriched with applications from applicants who perceive themselves to be very strong, and that's why they submitted a geographic preference, and they just wanted to send one more application to Stanford or Baylor or Northwestern or someplace that's outside of their geographic preference signaling regions because, hey, you never know, and they think that they're a very strong applicant. Now you could look at these data and reach an opposite conclusion and say, well, applicants to orthopedic surgery should always say no geographic preference because there's a slightly better probability here, even though it probably amounts to a rounding error. And so you should always say no geographic preference unless all of your applications fit neatly within three geographic regions. And if that's the conclusion you reach, then that's fine. I don't think we have data to support or refute that. Um, or my hypothesis either. My point here is to make a bigger point about how these data, they are useful. And I think that there's a general pattern across specialties that's telling, especially when you view it in the context of human psychology and our understanding about the way that residency programs work. And that's why my recommendation is for many applicants, assuming that this is in line with your values and your true desires, stack up your program signals and your geographic regions if that's possible. Now it's time for our final quick topic, the last part of geographic preference signaling, which is urban, suburban, and rural. But I'm not going to spend that much time on it because I don't think it's that impactful. So ARIS applicants will be invited to express a preference for urban, suburban, or rural training sites. But just like we saw before, you're not limited to just choosing one. You can't choose all three, but you could choose urban and suburban or urban and rural. What should you choose? I think you should use the principles that we developed before. Certainly most residency programs are located in urban locations. Um, if that's where you're applying, indicate that preference. At the same time, um, rural residency programs often struggle with recruitment and identifying that as a preference, assuming that it's something that you truly are interested in, probably gets you more bang for the buck. I wouldn't spend too much time trying to think about strategy with this because I just really think it doesn't matter that much to the average program. Think about where you really want to go. Think about which of these categories encompass most of the programs that you're applying to and put your nickel down there is my advice. But before I close, I want to generally address two very common frequently asked questions. The first is about couples matching. Obviously, if you're applying as part of a couple, there's additional layers of strategy to consider. For instance, should you and your partner submit your preference signals to the same institutions or to different ones? You can imagine three different scenarios. Scenario number one, where an applicant says, uh, I'm going to throw my preference signals to one set of programs. Partner B throws their signals to a completely different set of programs, knowing that maybe if you snag some interviews, you can always email the program coordinator or program director and, and maybe you know beg your way into getting an interview for the partner, especially if they really like you. So maybe that would result in more opportunities and a better chance of matching. It could be, right? Scenario two means, well, maybe you overlap. And, and maybe this is necessary because you're applying to specialties that have different numbers of signals. Uh, maybe that's the optimal strategy. Or maybe the optimal strategy is scenario three, where you, you load up all of your signals on the same programs and you throw in all your chips to that group of programs and that's it. Which of these is optimal? Well, I'll tell you, I don't know. And actually, I think it's unknowable. There's a lot of variables that would go into this. How strong is your application? What specialty are you trying to match in? What about your partner? How strong are they? What specialty are they trying to apply in? 
what would count as a win in the match for you? Do you need to be at the same program? Uh, do you need to be in the same city? Do you need to be in the same state? Are you willing to accept pairings where one person goes unmatched or not? All those things um, make it more complicated. Moreover, everybody's situation is different. I mean, think of all the permutations of different specialties and situations. It's hard to give across the board advice. And there's certainly no data about all those permutations that I could give you, but that's not gonna keep me from having an opinion. And that opinion is this, for most couples in most situations, I think you wanna to gravitate towards scenario number three, where you load up all your preference signals, all your geographic region preferences, all your urban, suburban, rural, any other chips that you have to cash, you cash them in on the same programs. Your, your chances of success are gonna be greater by having a small number of programs that really like you rather than by maximizing the number of small chances that you get. Focus hard on finding programs where you'll get high quality training and where you'll be supported and where you have a very competitive application. I promise these programs exist, but they may not be the programs that your advisor thinks are cool programs or that your dean really hopes that they're going to see when they look at the school's match list. I said before that preference signaling rewards applicants who accurately assess the strength of their application, and it punishes those who overreach. And if your couple's matching and you overreach, the, the magnitude of that error, it doesn't just affect you, it affects your partner too. And my opinion about overreaching applies to the other frequently asked question that I get, which is, well, I'm an international medical graduate. How should I approach preference signaling? And in addition to the things that I've highlighted before, I would highlight this. International medical graduates are already a disadvantaged group in residency selection when you compare them to USMDs and DOs. Any international medical graduate who's out there listening to this, I'm sure you've thought about that before. But what you may not have thought about is the way that that fact will impact the way that programs interpret the preference signals that they receive from you. Let me explain what I mean. Here in this graph, I've got the mean contiguous ranks for matched applicants by their educational background and citizenship status. And like I did earlier in the talk, we can take the number of ranks submitted for matched applicants as a surrogate for the number of interviews that that type of applicant completed. And so in 2022, as you can see, the average USMD senior submitted 13.8 contiguous ranks, so around 14 interviews. The average DO, around 12. The average US citizen international medical graduate, 8. The average non-US citizen international medical graduate, around 7. And program directors know this. And what that means is that programs that receive applications from international medical graduates, they're not as worried about those applicants getting over-interviewed as they are when they get applications from USMD and DO seniors. Remember, back at the beginning of this talk, I explained how one of the benefits of preference signaling for programs is that it allows programs to find applicants who are really interested in their program. It allows them to avoid over-interviewing the same elite pool of applicants who are interviewing at 20 programs and have a small chance of actually matching to their program. Any program that interviews international medical graduates knows that these types of applicants have fewer opportunities overall, and if you interview them and rank them, they actually have a pretty high chance of matching at your program. What that means is that the value of a signal is slightly diminished if you're an international medical graduate, and you don't want to waste your signals by overreaching at programs where you have a low probability of, of getting an interview offer. If you're an applicant with strong metrics, this may not matter much. Um, but if you're an applicant who's not naturally going to stand out in the pile, then I think you want to think hard about making sure that you distribute your signals to programs that, that have a track record of recruiting international medical graduates, but yet might be programs that aren't the most well-known IMG-friendly programs. I think that's where you're going to have the most value for your signals. And with that, I finally come to the end. I know it's been a long ride, but thanks for sticking with me and listening.